Hello and welcome to the online Sunday message for Lansdowne Evangelical Free Church for the 10th of April 2022, which is Palm Sunday. We're continuing our series in the book of Psalms and we've now reached Psalm 21. And just a word for you who are following uh, only on my own personal YouTube channel, that's the Peter Day channel, as opposed to the Lansdowne Evangelical Free Church channel. If you're following on my channel, um, you will notice there's a sermon missing uh, from Psalm 20. That's because uh, in Lansdowne, from time to time, we share the preaching ministry. And one of our brothers in the church, Mark Warden, preached uh, last Sunday, the 3rd of April, from Psalm 20. Uh, we were able to do an audio capture, not a video, an audio capture of the, the live sermon. And this is available on the Lansdowne Evangelical Free Church YouTube channel. And I've put a link for those of you on my channel. I put a link to that sermon uh, in, the com in, in the comments in the uh, description uh, underneath this video. So to have the full picture, please pause this video and go back and look at Psalm 20 first um, and then come back uh, to this one at a later date. But without any further explanation, let's read God's word from Psalm 21 and then we will pray and ask God's help uh, to understand and apply this message. Psalm 21, and I'm reading from the English Standard Version. O Lord, in your strength the king rejoices, and in your salvation how greatly he exults. You have given him his heart's desire, and have not withheld the request of his lips. For you meet him with rich blessings, you set a crown of gold upon his head. He asked life of you. You gave it to him. Length of days forever and ever. His glory is great through your salvation. Splendour and majesty you bestow on him. For you make him most blessed forever. You make him glad with the joy of your presence. For the king trusts in the Lord. And through the steadfast love of the Most High, he will not be moved. Your hand will find out all your enemies. Your right hand will find out those who hate you. You will make them as a blazing oven when you appear. The Lord will swallow them up in his wrath and fire will consume them. You will destroy their descendants from the earth and their offspring from among the children of men. Though they plan evil against you, though they devise mischief, they will not succeed. For you will put them to flight. You will aim at their faces with your bows. Be exalted, O Lord, in your strength. We will sing and praise your power. Let's pray. Our Father, we come to you this day in a world full of trouble where different people are doing terrible things in order to gain power and influence. Come to, to you in the middle of a broken world. We come to you perhaps in the middle of great personal crises. Lord God, you know all things. We thank you the assurance this psalm brings, Lord God, that you hear our prayers. You have given him. It says, his heart's desire and have not withheld the request of his lips. Hear our prayers, even now, for understanding of this passage. And give us a vision, we pray, of the greatness of our King, the Lord Jesus Christ, to whom every knee must bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. We pray that we would hear your voice in your word and that we would be encouraged and built up for your glory. And we ask it in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Amen. Now in the prayer just then I alluded to the trouble in this world and indeed the fact also we often face personal troubles as well. And the question is how can we trust God when trouble and danger seem to be so great? Psalm 21 encourages us that God is trustworthy and that he answers prayer. The previous psalm is a prayer for Israel's king as he faces battle. Psalm 21 is the answer to the prayer of Psalm 20. Now, when these two Psalms were first written as a prayer of David or a prayer for David, they pointed forward, the language we see, they pointed forward to God's chosen king, someone who was more than a human king. Someone who was God's appointed king. And we now know in the light of the New Testament that that king is the Lord Jesus Christ. So we can be assured, yes, of God's willingness and ability to answer prayer, however great the trouble. We can be assured that he is still in control, however great the turmoil must be, might be. But we can also gain encouragement from this psalm because it reveals to us the majesty and glory and victory of King Jesus Christ. So down in verse 5 it says, His glory is great through your salvation, splendour and majesty you bestow upon him. And if you jump forward uh, into the New Testament and Philippians chapter 2, you have that great hymn of praise to Jesus who Though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. And he's the one who became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. So he suffered. But then it says in Philippians 2, 9, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed in him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so we have pointers in Psalm 21 to the kind of things that we are, we, we're told about the, the ascended victorious reign in Christ in the New Testament. So it is a reminder to us that whatever is going on in this world, whatever the enemy is stirring up, whatever people are doing in their rebellion against the Lord, that nothing will defeat God's chosen king and because if you're a Christian you belong to God's chosen king he has purchased you he has saved you through his death and resurrection also nothing will ultimately defeat the king's people even if we go through death the king's people will not be defeated and also because of God's promises And because of what we see of the Lord Jesus in this psalm, we can be assured that nothing will stand in the way of God answering our prayers and nothing will stand in the way of his justice in the earth. So whether you are facing personal crisis, fear of the future, trouble in your circumstances, or whether we're thinking of those who are suffering in Ukraine, those who are waiting and hiding in their homes in Afghanistan, wondering if the Taliban will come calling. That wherever they are, wherever you are, whatever they or you are going through, the weakest saint can be assured that the king reigns and is victorious. But as we'll see, this psalm is also a great warning to those who consider themselves strong and beyond the reach of Almighty God. 
whether they sit in the Kremlin or the White House or Number 10 Downing Street or the Forbidden City in Beijing or in the boardrooms of the, of the multinational companies, they need to tremble before this king because this king of glory is exalted and he reigns and he knows all their deeds and he will find them wherever they are. So let's come to this psalm and unpack it and see how God will speak to us. Essentially, the psalm is split into two sections and a conclusion. So verse one, verses one to seven speaks of the kindness of God in answering the prayers of his king. Verses eight to 12 speak of the justice of God against those who hate him and uh, hate his people and hate his king. And so we have uh, allusions here back to Psalm 2, where it says that God has installed his king on Zion, his holy hill, while the nations plot in vain. The king enthroned in heaven laughs. And then we have in verse 13 a conclusion of praise. Be exalted, O God, in your strength. We will sing and praise your power. But firstly, then, the kindness of God, the kindness of God in answering the prayers of his people. And in particular, in Psalm 21, in answering the prayers of his king, King David, and ultimately pointing forward to the Lord Jesus Christ. This whole section is full of thanksgiving. Verse one, that in your strength, the king rejoices. Also, verse one, in your salvation, how greatly he exalts. And verse seven, the king trusts in the Lord. So this is full of praise. It is full of confidence. And of course, again, as we think on the Lord Jesus Christ, he is the one who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame. He's the one who is now victorious and sits down, has sat down at the right hand of God. So it says the end of verse six, you make him glad with the joy of your presence. The kindness of God, the kindness of God in answering prayers. And as we realise that if, you're, if we're Christians, we're in Christ, we can be assured of the kindness of God in answering our prayers also. We see in verse one, the source of the answer. O oh Lord, in your strength, the king rejoices. We are weak and he is strong. And because we are weak and he is strong, we need to go to him in our prayers and tell him about our weakness. Sometimes we feel ashamed to be honest about how weak we are. We may feel weak in faith and we berate ourselves saying, I should have a stronger faith. And of course we should have a stronger faith. But the answer is not to berate ourselves, it's to go in our weakness to the King of glory and say, Lord, I need your strength. Maybe you feel weak physically and sick or overwhelmed by fear or battered by depressive thoughts. And again, uh, very often, uh, unless it's a physical illness, we kind of feel, oh, I shouldn't feel depressed. I shouldn't feel this. I shouldn't think this. I shouldn't be fearful. I shouldn't be discouraged. I shouldn't doubt. But we need to take our weaknesses to the Lord and seek his strength. Remember, again, this was mentioned last week. My power, says the Lord to Paul, is made perfect in your weakness. I'll boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that his power may be seen. And so as we realise our weakness and we go to him, we receive his strength. So Psalm 21 encourages us to go to him honestly. Unless we feel, and, and, and just one more uh, reminder of the Lord Jesus, just to encourage you. If even the Lord Jesus knelt before the Father and said, Father, if you are willing, let this cup be removed from me. Then, yes, we can come in our weakness to the Lord God and seek his strength. 
But we also see in verse one that God has already given us the greatest thing. It says, and in your salvation, how greatly he exalts. Now, of course, in its original context, Psalm 21 was speaking of the king, David's victory over physical enemies. And, or, and some, indeed, some translations use the word victory here in verse one. But of course, the word salvation in the it, it, it is it can mean victory. It can it can mean rescue from difficult tr- from from troubled circumstances in all kinds of things. But actually, all of these rescues in the Old Testament point us forward to the greatest rescue of all, which is rescue of God's people from their sin, from eternal death and judgment, and being being brought out of darkness into His marvelous light. And to have that living relationship with him. That is the greatest thing that our King Jesus has won for us. Because he came and fought the battle with the enemy. He came and suffered in our place for our sins. He came and confronted death. He came and defeated death. And now we, his people, can exult. And by exult that means to be bursting forth with triumphant joy. We can exult in his salvation. But notice the origin of the prayers. Verse 2, you have given him his heart's desire. And again, this was touched on last week. So it says, um, verse 4 of Psalm 20, may he grant you your heart's desire and fulfil all your plans. And we need to ask our question, what does, what does that actually mean? Can we, if my heart's desire is, is for a, a mansion in the country, is that God going to give us that? Well, we're encouraged to bring our desires to him. So uh, Psalm 145 verse 19, the Lord fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves him. But there in Psalm 145, we see there is a context to that desire. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. So those who fear him, those who hold him in awe and reverence, their desires are in tune with his. Just as in that garden of Gethsemane, the Lord Jesus was saying, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And we're told in, I think it's in Luke's account, that an angel came and strengthened him. And so there he was strengthened as he cried out to the Lord and his heart was in tune with his father's. And so when we come to pray, we need to say, Lord, let me pray and be in accordance with your will. And we search the scriptures and we cry out to God to make the the desires expressed in the scriptures to be our own desires. And as our own desires are in tune with his will, so we can boldly stand on verse two and say, Lord, you said to David, you've given him his heart's desires. So will you do that now for me as I cry to you? Notice also in verse two, the method of his praying. It says you've not withheld the request of his lips. That's very interesting. Here David is speaking his prayers aloud. And so uh, David records you've not withheld the request of his lips. So the words he has spoken to God God has not held back in answering. And the reason I say that's instructive to us is very often in in evangelical circles, in fact, in all Christendom, we're very much encouraged, unless it's in a public setting where we're leading prayers, that we just pray quietly. And yes, there's a there's a place for praying quietly in, in a public setting. You don't want to stand up on the bus and start praying aloud because that puts you in the category of the of the, of the Pharisees in, in Matthew chapter six, uh, praying to be seen by men. But actually, when you're on your own in private, there is no need to keep quiet. And often as we speak our prayers, we find our mind is more focused than just sitting and praying in our hearts. So let's follow David's example. 
as long as we're able to and in that setting when we can do that do that is to to pray our prayers aloud and I believe you will find that very very helpful in your praying I've said it before uh, in other sermons but it's worthwhile being reminded uh, of how David prayed with his lips and not just in his heart both are valid but often praying with our lips is helpful and then notice also the response to prayer verse one again look at the the praise and the joy in verse one and again in the conclusion of the psalm of verse 13 we will sing and praise your power here david is overjoyed with thanksgiving for answer prayer and that is clearly a lesson to us so often we take answer prayer for granted we uh, receive god's gracious provision and protection And we say nothing back. May the Lord help us to be thankful and deliver us from being like the ten lepers, so the nine lepers who never said thank you to the Lord Jesus Christ. Thankfulness should be a characteristic of Christian living. And even in the midst of great trial, we can look for the answers to prayer and we need to remember to be thankful. Continuing uh, through the the rest of this part of Psalm 21, we see the psalmist getting very specific about how the Lord has given uh, the answer to his king. And uh, here the the psalmist is talking about the king. So while it may have been written by David, it equally may be written on David's behalf about David, we see whoever it is, be it a, a worship leader or, 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 or a priest, um, or talking and, and reflecting on how God has answered the king in his battles. And of course, we can look at this psalm and we can reflect and see how the Lord God Almighty, the Father, has answered the prayers of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and given him the victory. So on a very uh, human level, the, 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 the David um, went out to battle and, and he won a victory. And you can, you can read it in, in 2 Samuel about a crown being set on David's head. That's verse 3. You meet him with rich blessings. So uh, in some ways that word meet in some contexts can, can be meeting in battle. But here is a meeting in a crowning, a meeting in bringing blessing and celebration. Or maybe it's symbolizing the people coming out to meet David when he comes back from battle and to rejoice with him. Verse four, he asked, life of you, and you gave it to him. So David was protected. Uh, Verse five, his glory is great through your salvation. So David became a powerful and effective king. But as you read through these verses, you can't think, well, there's more than David here. You meet him with rich blessings as Jesus came out of the grave and he ascended to the Father and he seated at the Father's right hand. And we see something of, of that glorious uh, coronation in um, Psalm 24, which we'll come to. Who is the King of glory who's coming in? Lift up your heads, O you gates. The King of glory is coming in. And so as Jesus ascends, having won his victory, he he. He then pours out the Holy Spirit. So, so Jesus is the one, he, he, and he asks the Father on our behalf, and he pours out his blessing upon our lives, that he has length of days forever and ever. He is risen and exalted never to die again. Uh, and he is full of glory and splendor and majesty. He is reigning upon the throne. It says, for you make him most Bless forever, verse 6. And, and in, in the footnote in the ESV, it says you make him a source of blessing. So he is the one who pours out the Father's blessings upon us. And you make him glad with the joy of your presence. And again, we have a pointer back to uh, Psalm 16. So Psalm 16, verse 11, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So all of this is contained in a psalm about our great and victorious King Jesus. But you need to realise if you're a Christian, 
that you are in Christ. So there's a sense in which your, or his victory rather, is your victory. So a day will come when he will set a crown of glory on your head that will never fade away. He has given you eternal life when you called upon him. He saved you and he gave you eternal life. He clothes you in his righteousness and he will raise your body imperishable. He will bless you forever and make you glad in his presence. This is the joy and hope of the Christian, which is expressed to us in uh, the first uh, application uh, in the joy and hope of David. And then pointing forward to the joy and victory of the Messiah. And then because we're in, in him, pointing forward to our joy and victory. May glad in the joy of his presence. But to receive these blessings, to have this hope and assurance, we need to be a people who trust him. So verse 7 says, the king trusts in the Lord. And my question is, do you trust in the Lord? Have you turned from your sin and put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? And we can trust in the Lord because it says that also in verse 7, through the steadfast love of the Most High, he shall not be moved. Now, we said before that word translated steadfast love is, uh, is Hebrew for, or it translates to Hebrew for covenant love. God's unbreakable commitment, God's unbreakable, unchangeable love for his covenant people. His unbreakable, unchangeable love for his eternal son, whom he covenanted with in eternity. The, the son would come and save a people. And God, in his covenant commitment, raised Christ from the dead. And from, uh, uh, from the, the womb, we're told that, that the Lord Jesus, the Messiah, in those servant songs of Isaiah, put his trust in the Lord. And he fulfilled what this psalm declares. And then in him, if you are a believer, you trust the Lord and you are a recipient of that unbreakable covenant love. And so as it says, the end of verse seven, he, that is you if you're a Christian, shall not be moved. And again, there's so many uh, linkages uh, among these passages of scripture. Psalm 16 and verse eight, I bless the Lord. Sorry, sorry 16 verse eight, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. And so we lean on him, we trust on him, we're real with him, we come to him in our weakness, we tell him our troubles, we bring him our desires and say, Lord, make my desires in line with your desires. And we boldly declare our desires to him and we say lord give us the desires of our hearts carry us through this life fill us with that glorious hope as we consider our king jesus who has won the victory i don't understand always why god allows things to happen i may be filled with concern about family and finance and the future may be filled with fear but still i will trust the lord May the Lord help us to trust him. But then, I've rather taken a very long time with that part of the psalm, so I must hurry on. We come to some very solemn verses in almost complete contrast. In fact, not almost, actually in complete contrast with verses 1 to 7. God's redemptive plan is to bless the nations, includes blessing the nations through David, through his people. And when the people of Israel were attacked, God would defend them. And that's what this psalm is talking about. But again, we see pointers forward to a final victory. 
that is struck and spoken of in these verses is so great, it must surely be referring also to the final victory of this King Jesus when he returns. Now, when we look at verses like this that speak of being put to flight and aiming bows and arrows and blazing ovens and all of these things, we think, well, God can't do that. But God is a God of justice. And God is also a God who offers life and calls to repentance. So back in Psalm 7 and verse 12, it says, if a man does not repent, God will wet his sword. He has bent and readied his bow. So it says in Psalm 21, verse 12, you will put them to flight. You will aim at their faces with your bows. So Psalm 7 gives us a warning. And then Psalm 21 gives us a fulfillment if we do not heed that warning. And the challenge really is to ask ourselves a question, whose side am I on? I urge you, if you're not a Christian, or you're just a church goer, an occasional person who nods at God from time to time, please consider these verses and search your heart. Yes, the king is victorious. The king is coming back again. Verse 8. There's no escape. Your hand will find out all your enemies. Your right hand will find out those who hate you. There are many people who consider themselves immune to God and his holy justice. But Psalm 21 and verse 8 says no one is immune. God will find each one. As we saw a number of months ago in Revelation chapter 6, verses 15 and 16. Then the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne. And from the wrath of the Lamb. That's a serious verse. Your hand, it says, Psalm 21 8, will find out all your enemies. Everyone will stand in God's presence one day. Verse 9 You will make them as a blazing oven when you appear. The Lord will swallow them up in his wrath. This is just wrath not an outburst like we might have God's wrath is perfectly just and fire will consume them and when it, that word translated appear means literally the time of your face so for those who are don't belong to this king haven't trusted the Lord the time of God's face will be a terrible thing Contrast that with verse 6. You make him glad with the joy of your presence, or literally, the joy of your face. The same appearing of God Almighty, the same second coming of Jesus Christ, presents a chop, but will give two responses great joy or great holy fire of justice whose side are you on and also verse 10 it is more important that we build for eternity and we build for earth verse 10 speaks of descendants or literally fruit so that could actually refer to Success in earthly terms. People make monuments. People want to leave a legacy behind. They want to achieve things in earthly time. They want to be thought well of. And they also want to build up their family and their offspring. 
from among the children of men. They plot and plan and scheme, verse 11, though they plan evil against you, though they devise mischief, they will not succeed. We plan for earthly success, but we need to be planning for eternity and bowing the knee and trusting the Lord and turning from our sin and planning to please him and live for his glory. Receiving the free gift of eternal life and living for, living for him in response to that. That's what we need to be doing. Not living for the here and now. But as we reflect on these verses and the context of a psalm which teaches us about the messianic king. There is something incredible here. Not only is it incredible, the victory of Jesus, who's come, died on the cross, and defeated death and the enemy, and uh, has paid for our sins, and is risen and ascended and glorified, and will be forever and ever, and is coming back. That is wonderful. But he has also been through verses 8 to 12 for us in order to come to the victory. There on the cross, the hand of the Lord found him. And the hand of the Lord placed upon him the sins of the world. And there on the cross, the blazing oven and holy fire of God was poured upon him. And there on the cross, as it speaks in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 8, by oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people, that he suffered, he died. He was, in, as it were, in earthly terms, without descendants, without anyone. And he was there on the cross, put to flight, as it says in Psalm 20. 1 12. God turned his loving face away from him and he was cast out of the loving presence of the Father, which is why we get the Psalm 22 again placed there by the Holy Spirit in just the right order. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is what our Messiah, the King Jesus, did. But you know, he did it for us. He did it for his enemies. So uh, Psalm uh, 21, I'm, I'm jumping around here. Psalm 21, your hand will find out all your enemies. Romans 8 and um, verse 10, for while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God. So uh, the things that God's enemies deserve and are pointed out in verses 8 to 12 of Psalm 21 are the very people, the very people, the enemies, that is you and me before we were believers, the very people that Christ came to die for and the very things that God warns people, warns don't be my enemy because I, my hand will find you out. Don't build for the earth because all that will be swept away. Don't scheme against me because your schemes will fail. Come to me. Put your trust in my King Messiah. Be saved. Be forgiven. All of that was achieved by this righteous King. The battle he faced. The battle that is fulfilled by Psalm 21 is God the Son clothing himself in flesh, becoming fully man, walking this earth, dying on a cross, defeating death and rising from the dead and doing that for his enemies and suffering what his enemies deserve. And so in Isaiah 53 and verse 10, yes, it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. 
When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. He shall, and again, out of verse 11, Isaiah 50, 11, out of the anguish of his soul, or the traditional translation, he shall see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. He's done this. So in contrast to those who continue to reject him, who will be swept away, as it were, all they've built swept away. Jesus Christ, even though he die, will see the offspring. And if you are Christian, that offspring is you. What a saviour. What a king. How great he is. How trustworthy he is. Which brings us to the conclusion of the psalm in verse 13. Be exalted, O God, in your strength. Notice verse 1. O Lord, in your strength, the king rejoices. So now the response as, as the king has received the strength. Jesus did all he came to do. His prayers were answered. He fulfilled everything. He is now with joy at the Father's right hand. And he's done that for his enemies, who if they will but repent, will share in the fruit of his victory. So if you or a Christian, you can say, yes, Lord, you be exalted, you be praised, you be honoured, you are great. I worship you. I'm going to sing. I'm going to praise you for your power, your power that saved me. Yes, the power of cre you showed in creation in Psalm 19 is awesome. It's great. It's amazing. But the power you showed in saving me, a sinner, in not compromising your holiness, that in your perfect peace and your perfect justice in the cross, you kissed a guilty world in love, as the song says. You reached down to me, who was your enemy, and you rescued me. And you've made me one of your offspring. And so I rejoice and I praise you and I thank you. And can I also say to you, all the things we outlined at the beginning and throughout that yes, we struggle, we were fearful, we worried about the future, we're concerned about our families and our finances and our circumstances. We're in a, a dreadful situation in this country, but that's nothing compared to what we see in the wider world. And we grieve over what we see in Ukraine and in other countries around the world, the horrors that are going on, the uncertainty, the fear of destruction. If this, this war gets even more out of hand than it is already, uh, but we can stop right now. And we can look up to this great king who's won this great victory. This king, if you're a Christian, who's your king and say, Lord, just like verse seven says, I trust in you. And through your steadfast love, I will not be moved. And finally. If you're still living in verses eight to 12. You still haven't turned to Christ. And put your trust in him. You still haven't received him as your king. There's, there's no fence to sit on. You're either in verses 1 to 7 or you're in verses 8 to 12. Stop living in verses 8 to 12. Don't build just for this earth. Turn to Jesus. Receive forgiveness for your sins. Become no longer God's enemy. Become God's child. He washes away your sin, your guilt, your shame. He clothes you with righteousness, adopts you as his child and seats you with Christ in heavenly places and gives you a sure and certain hope that when Christ returns and you see his face, you'll be able to say, you have made me glad with the joy of your presence. Let's pray. Our Father, you know where each of us is. And if we're not yours yet, please show yourself mighty to save and open our eyes to see. And for those of us who are yours already, fill our vision so much with our great King that our fears, our failures, Lord, our burdens, Lord, our pain, Lord, our uncertainty, our sorrow, our doubts, our discouragements. Lord, we 
see you upon the throne. We see you in your victory. And Lord, you bring us assurance and faith. And Lord, help us to be bold in seeking your face. That we will be able to say with King David and with King Jesus, O oh Lord, in your strength I rejoice. For you have given me your heart's, my heart's desire and you've not withheld the request of my lips. Hear our prayers, Father, for we ask them all in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. May the Lord bless and encourage you. Thank you for listening.